Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a full frame-by-frame -frame breakdown of every detail you missed in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Now that the film is available in 4K digital, the hundreds of animation details and Easter eggs can now be found. And what's really great about these Spider-Verse movies is that it's not just comic book references, it's a vast web of attention to detail worked into this film by and for lovers of filmmaking, the history and craft of animation, all of it filled with soul that these animators wove into these characters and into their worlds. Now, we've made a few videos breaking down this movie already, but here, right now, is the definitive Across the Spider-Verse analysis brought to you by folks who truly do go through these two hour and 22 minute movies frame by frame. And I did a similar analysis for the 2018 Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse on the Deep Dive channel. Subscribe to that and all three of the channels of our network. Also, sag has informed us that entertainment journalists like new rock stars are allowed to continue covering movies like this, but we joined these unions and calling to the studios and streamers to make a fair deal with screenwriters and with actors. Okay, literally nine seconds into the film, you see the word cough appear in the lower right corner. <clears throat> Producers Phil Lord and Chris Miller added the sound of a cough to the opening seconds of the 2018 Into the Spider-Verse, which was then a callback to their previous film, 2014's 22 Jump Street. They just like the joke of one of their coughs being captured in the audio. But here, it's not just the sound of a cough, it's the literal text word cough. They want us to see it. What makes Across the Spider-Verse unique to the 2018 film is that the animators lift the hood to show us the seams of their work with storyboard keyframes, editor's notes, background lines, to make us appreciate the effort and to invite us into this story in progress from the dueling protagonists Gwen Stacy and Miguel O'Hara. That's right, this sequel is less of a Miles Morales story, it's Gwen's story of regret for not being a better friend Miles, as Miguel O'Hara attempts to hijack control, edit, and force that narrative through his prescribed canon events. The opening logos of Sony, Columbia Pictures, and Marvel all glitch, and on the Marvel one you can see a Miles tag from the 2018 film on his name tags, the Lord & Miller production company logo, fine mustaches, with both of these actual animators depicted in this old time he ad, but listen closely here. Yeah, you heard a dolphin sound effect in there, a running joke from Lord and Miller's Clone High that they also put into the beginning of the 2018 film. Then with a heavy bell thud, the approved by the Comics Code Authority stamp, which was put on all comic book covers in the 1950s to reassure parents that these comics wouldn't glorify crime or corrupt their kids' minds. But the dark tone of this stamp might be a clue that Miles and Aaron of Earth-42 are not criminals designed to corrupt our children. They're actually heroic vigilantes trying to fight the good fight against the Sinister Six cartel of that universe. Concentric circle represent Gwen Stacy's drumming for the Mary Jane's band. Her first line is, Let's do things differently this time. Like, so differently. It's a callback to the way the spider people would introduce themselves in the past film. All right, let's do this one last time. All right, people, let's do this one last time. All right, people, let's start at the beginning one last time. But Gwen's voice over here frames this whole opening monologue as really her recruiting pitch to the other spider heroes to save Miles at the end of the movie. She's expressing regret here. Let's do things differently. Let's not screw up with Miles this time. That's why this opening montage shows both images of Gwen and Miles from the first movie and what is to come in the second movie. Miles and Gwen sitting upside down, Miles releasing Gwen's web, Miles and Gwen in the web of life and destiny room, the two of them on the bullet train, Gwen stuck in the go home machine, and more. All of it is really a prologue for the events to come. We are hearing Gwen later in this movie talking to Peter B. Parker, Mayday, Spider-Man Noir, Spider-Ham, Penny, Hobie Brown, Peter, and Margot after Miles has been stuck in Earth-42. Because here she says, and now he's on his own and he's not the only one. And I think that other one that Gwen is referring to might just be herself, but also Earth-42 Miles. And notice how in the flashback of Miles' dead spider, number 42 includes a shot of some tweezers picking it up, which we didn't see before, because we are now seeing the moment this dead spider was recovered by Dr. Jonathan Owen in 1610. We see the selfie Gwen and Miles took that she had on her phone at the end of the 2018 film from the Hudson Valley bus. You can see Peter B. Parker's legs outstretched behind them, but it shakes here because we later see this is inside of her drum. So she is literally drumming her guilt. This percussion on her friend. Gwen wears a Smashing Hearts shirt, 1989 tour, and her bandmates call her Def Leppard, a reference to the band Def Leppard, and a pun calling her Def D-E-A-F from her drumming, which is a specific reference to Gwen's very first comic introduction in 2014. In the comics and here in Earth 65, the Mary Janes consist of lead singer Mary Jane Watson, Gloria Grant on guitar, and Betty Brant on keys. Gloria and Betty both being employees of the Daily Bugle. So Gwen's universe of Earth 65 was given a watercolor aesthetic that just looks amazing with pastel color colors of pink and blue and white, which yes, are the colors of the trans flag, which Gwen has as a poster in her bedroom. Gwen says, In this line of work, you always wind up a solo act. 
And I love how the animators briefly put Gwen in her suit just for the phrase in this line of work, because that's what she's wearing when she's working. In the window behind her, you can see Miles' face, but in the other window across the subway car is her memory of Earth 65 Peter Parker, voiced in this movie by Jack Quaid. In these flashbacks, Gwen has longer hair because this was before Miles stuck his hand to her head and she had to shave it. Gwen and Peter and their parents pray before dinner in this rapid flicker montage. One of Peter's shirts is a green, white, and purple polo that he wears in the 90s animated series. Another one shows Peter in a lizard costume as he will become the lizard. Meanwhile, Gwen's Halloween costume is the VLC media player app and they are all eating bagels, which is the critical food that led to the spot and recurs throughout this movie as a symbol of the multiverse, something that this movie shares with everything everywhere all at once. It's also worth pointing out that in these shots, holding May's hand is Uncle Ben because he is still alive in this reality. And Peter's bully in this reality is not Flash Thompson, it is Ned Leeds. And we get another sick transition. Gwen's subway car opens to her prom night memory. And as we go from her shorter hair and her street clothes, camera pants to her friends, and then back to Gwen for her fuller hair and her prom outfit. And look at the surroundings here. This is her gymnasium. We understand why Mary Jane's band rehearsal at this gym was so triggering for Gwen. It was the exact same location that the lizard attacked her and where Peter died. And knowing that the lizard is Peter who had the hots for Gwen, it's just a little awkward that this lizard is wearing a tux jacket when you pause at this frame. It seems like he's just positioned a bit too... Eh, never mind. As Peter dies, Gwen's back on the subway in the spider suit, and then as the doors slide open, she transitions back to Gwen. All these transitions, so smooth. You hear the voice of J. Jonah Jameson reporting. Roger Mouse says Captain George Stacy leads the manhunt for Spider Woman. Who is she? And why won't she show her face? Yeah, J.K. Simmons' voice is Triple J here. And so far, he seems to have played Jameson in every single film reality that we've seen. Now, Gwen is tinted blue in this pink world, as when you feel depressed, it can feel like everyone else is having a bubblegum day except you. Her father, George Stacy, wears a Visions Academy gymnastics sweatshirt, showing that he's such a supportive dad. And while her whole room is blue to match her, when she hugs her dad, the watercolor spreads the warm fuchsia color outward, because just a simple hug really can change your entire world. So George arrives at the Guggenheim and says, Yuri, explain to me how a guy with a 40-foot wingspan just waltzed into the Guggenheim unnoticed. Yeah, Yuri is Yuri Watanabe, a cop introduced in the Amazing Spider-Man comics who turns into the villain Wraith. And she kind of hints at that here. Hey, it's New York. Everyone's got their thing. But Gwen webs them up. How's the manhunt for me going? Yeah, she lowers her voice there, just like Miles always lowers his voice with his cop father. An alternate universe, Vulture is voiced by Yorma Tacone, attacking, brought to this universe by the Collider incident in the 2018 film. This Vulture is Adriano Tumino from an Italian Renaissance universe, depicted in discolored parchment in the style of Leonardo da Vinci sketches. His attacks often have da Vinci-style notes scribbled beside them because da Vinci always showed his work. And I just realized that he wears a traditional Italian Commedia dell'arte mask that are known for these huge hooked noses. And when he lowers over his armored mask, it is a plague doctor mask, which looks like a bird beak. It's just incredibly clever character design that works on multiple levels. Now he has landed in front of the Jeff Koons retrospective exhibit, which is a real exhibit at the Guggenheim with these balloon animal figures made from stainless steel. And a Renaissance artist like him would totally be disgusted with postmodernism. So the artists working on this movie use the action to teach us a little bit about art and design. I mean, it's more of a meta commentary on what we call art, but it's... It's, it's just like how these movies require the artists making them to rethink the way film animation can even work. Vulture says, Ciao, ragazzo. which translates to bye girl on the screen. And she's rescued by Miguel O'Hara, voiced by Oscar Isaac. You're the Blue Panther. No. The Caped Blue Satyr. No, I'm- Dark Garfield. No, stop. Macho Libre. Yes, of course, references to the Black Panther and to Batman, the Cape Crusader, but also Dark Garfield, as in Dark Andrew Garfield Spider-Man, like a Spider-Man who wouldn't care if Gwen Stacy dies. Notice how the edges of Miguel's body have these hatch lines, which make his shoulders and corners look sharper and more barbed, someone you don't want to give a hug, but also a futuristic work in progress, never complete, never good enough. His comic book lands on the same stack that we ended the 2018 film with. You see Miles Morales, Gwen Stacy, Spider-Ham, Spider-Man Noir's comics. So all these new heroes are building on the stack cumulatively throughout this film series. And these hatch lines now are more pronounced. As Miguel begins to explain his function, you can see blue lines, which is what animators and artists use when they're sketching out the dimensions of their characters, lines that are later erased. But Miguel also has to, has to show his work to prove himself. This shot of him here is one of the animation changes they made from theatrical to digital. Miguel now moves closer to the camera while his background, showing Ben Riley, Jessica Drew, Margot Kess, Spectacular Spider-Man, and Ezekiel Sims, moves away, forming a dolly zoom effect, which also makes Miguel more of a narcissistic front man that is alienated from his society. Vulture looms into view behind Miguel and he doesn't sense it, which is a little detail showing that he might not have spider sense and he might have to force his connection to the others with his technological know-how. As Miguel and Gwen bicker
Undertaker on Tamino's wings, he layers over a thicker helmet to protect him from the debris that he's flying through to try to shake them off. It's a little cool detail I noticed. But then Miguel says, you Don't even get me started on Doctor Strange and the little nerd back on Earth 1999-99. Who's Doctor Strange? Sounds like he maybe shouldn't practice medicine. Yes, Earth 19999 has in the past been the numerical designation for the MCU films and shows, but it was thrown into question when Christine Palmer called it 616 in Multiverse of Madness. But either way, this proves that the MCU and these animated films occupy the same multiverse because he's talking directly about the multiversal crisis from Spider-Man No Way Home. Miguel says the Vulture has hammer space and we see a little editor's note text window reading an infinite extra dimensional storage area for cartoon hammers and the like, referring to Spider-Ham's mallet gift to Miles that he said could fit into any pocket and not take up any space. Lila, aka Lyrate, life form approximation, returns to the 2018 movie post credit scene voiced by Greta Lee. Call for backup. What? Call for backup. Come on. Please just call for- Yeah, I already called her. Ah! But I enjoyed that. Yeah, in early theatrical versions, Lila does a fist bump, but her filter now makes him an Easter bunny like nothing more than a vehicle for Easter eggs. And you know what he would say to that? I'm more than that. I'm the eldest boy. By the way, Lord and Miller confirmed that the reason why there were some changes from early theatrical versions is that they had to send a really early version of the movie to French censors for dubbing purposes. And that between that time and the worldwide release, they had a couple more tweaks that they wanted to make. I also just noticed that Miguel tries to grab and strangle Lila out of anger, even though she's a hologram, the guy has rage issues. And so we meet spider Woman man Jessica Drew, voiced by Issa Rae, who has an outfit that matches her red, black, and yellow color scheme from the comics. And yes, she is pregnant. Are you, uh, oh, this? We don't know the sex yet. My husband wants it to be a surprise. Uh, he's really corny, <laughs> but so hot. Yeah, we do not meet her husband in this movie, but I think it's gonna end up being Tukuya Yamashiro, the Japanese Spider-Man. When the vulture falls, he hits a beam and it says, notte notte, which is Italian for night night, but Gwen kicks in a gear. She closes her eyes and she sees the spinning helicopter blades as the same rotation of her spinning drumstick in her fingers. And suddenly it's the same as just getting into rhythm of playing her drum kit. And it is awesome. We get this great hero music, but whenever Miguel jumps in with his zigzag techno webs, it's a discordant screech. <laughs> But the three work together to stop the helicopter from crashing. Yeah, I think it's a Banksy. Yeah, they use Post Malone's vocal cameo soundbite from the 2018 film. Yeah, I think it's a Banksy. This webbed up helicopter is reminiscent of a scene from the first Spider-Man Insomniac game, since that game is now canon in this universe with Insomniac Spider-Man and the Spider Society. It's just kind of fun to think about Gwen and the Insomniac Peter maybe trading some stories about stopping helicopter crashes. But Gwen reveals herself to her father and the watercolor drips are just gorgeous in the scene. George is surrounded by blood red paint, seeing his daughter as a murderer, but behind Gwen are the pink eye pieces of her mask because that is all he can see her as. And as he reads her, her Miranda writes, initially he can cannot even look at her. But Miguel helps her out and he flips open his wrist device and you can see his current universe says E65, but recent visits, E298, that's his home universe of Nueva York, E1610, that's Miles's universe, and E138, that is Hobie Brown's universe. So moving on to Miles' parents meeting with the guidance counselor, his father Jeff's badge now reads Morales, whereas in the 2018 movie, his last name was Davis, meaning he took his wife's last name. In the comics, they go into why Jeff and Rio gave Miles Rio's surname of Morales. Jeff didn't want Miles to have his dad's last name, basically. In Brooklyn, they there is a Mother Shucker stand, which is a real life oyster and clam vendor in the New York area. The bodega security camera lists the current date as July 11th, 2023, which explains why earlier one of the vendors was fanning himself with his hat. This would also mean Miles goes to school year round, including the summer at Brooklyn Visions Academy. The register in the bodega reads, game over, man. And we meet the spot, Jonathan Owen, voiced by Jason Schwartzman. Like Miguel O'Hara, he was drawn with deliberate blue animation lines that were not erased because he is another incomplete work in progress. Inside the ATM that he tries to rob, the $100 bills do not have Benjamin Franklin face, but the face of Alan Hawkins, Sony's animation supervisor. As the spot struggles with the machine, the spots on his leg accidentally slide over to the machine and then pressing down with his foot causes another hole to open and that's what caused the machine to blip back up into the crosswalk. And yes, the spot calls it an ATM machine and a pin number, both of which are redundant phrases, but as is miles later when he calls it chai tea. And in the bodega display case are more bagels, the food that first turned Jonathan Owen against Miles. In Miles' sketch pad, we see that he's drawn past Spider-Man villains that he's fought since the first film, a version of the Hammerhead, aka Joseph. We actually saw a beardless version of him in the mugshot wall in the 2018 film, a version of Frogman and the Beetle, and then Grizzly. And then at the end of this, Miles' punch goes through the spot and he punches himself. We also see Miles' suit design include the note abs, no abs. And when we see Aunt May selling her house and moving, the realtor was Madeline Watson, who is the mother of Mary Jane Watson. We see Miles hosting Jeopardy with some fun categories, swinging in the rain, arachnidiums, spider sense and sense 
sensibility, the wide web world, and Thwip It. We also learned that he adores baby powder, which he had to apologize for, which seems like a reference to the Johnson & Johnson settlement over cancer-causing baby powder. We see the video has over 10 million views, but somehow 69 million downvotes with a comment saying, old Spider-Man didn't need baby powder, even though Peter Parker told Miles to use baby powder. You're gonna wanna use baby powder in the soup. And then Miles growing a mustache leads him to make a second apology video, which has over 11 million views, but 70 million downvotes. And the top comment is, I heard it was made from actual spider legs, though for real. 1610, J. Jonah Jameson broadcasts from a show called Triple J Today, and Miles' mom says, I hear that new Spider-Man is Puerto Rican. <laughs> nah, he, he seems more Dominican to me. This could actually be foreshadowing how the actor who voices Earth 42 Miles, Jarrell Jerome, is Dominican. And I love how when Miles disrobes to his suit, whereas before his neck was bare, now the suit covers his neck, and his parents toss the couch into the air, and then it never comes down, because this is all a fantasy. Miles updates the no expectations art from the 2018 film to now include Gwen, Peter B. Parker, Aaron, and his prowler form, Spider-Ham, Noir, and Penny. Jeff's text correct to, this is Emporkage, Emporfkent, and important, and Jeff sees response dots. <laughs> There's bubbles now, hold on. Soon after this, Miles and the spot will be covered in bubbles and suds in the car wash. But first they fly past Rio and Jeff outside the window and Miles snags a goose. And from that car wash, they land in the phone party. That is the hipster coffee shop that people were lining up for at the beginning of the 2018 film. With the suds inside of it, it now becomes a literal foam party. And the hipster behind the spot is eating, would you know it, a bagel. As the two tumble through the next portal, one of the bagels follows them. After webbing up the spot, Miles pats his head and we see the text, good cow. This was be after Miles thought the spot was a cow. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Watching stuff frame by frame is great, but it can also be really rewarding to zoom out and look at things like story, pacing, and character development. For a movie, you can just let it play out. But when you're the target of analysis, it's better to get some help from BetterHelp. Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just going through a hard time, therapy can give you some tools to approach your life in a very different way. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com slash new rockstars. To get started, just answer a few questions about what you're looking for from therapy and what your preferences are. BetterHelp will then match you with a therapist from their network that's right for you. If you don't really fit in with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a therapist for free without stressing about insurance or who's in your network or anything like that. You can always benefit from talking to somebody and getting things off your chest. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit Visit betterhelp.com slash do rockstars. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. When Miles returns to his dorm room, he stops to let the pigeons fly past, like at a crosswalk, remembering from the 2018 movie to wait around the corner to avoid smacking into pigeons. His roommate, Ganky Lee, is playing the PS5 Spider-Man 2 video game. On his wall is a poster for soccer player Huang Min Sun, known for doing a Spider-Man celebration when he scores, and on the wall is an insane Easter egg. A New York Bulletin front page reading Hero or Rogue with a photo of Daisy Ridley Quake from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh my god, suggesting that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. might be canon in at least this side of the Marvel multiverse. And really, let's just assume all the multiverse. Gonky says, I'm not your guy in the chair. Referencing the MCU Ned, who loved being Peter Parker's guy in the chair, and Jacob Batalon was totally cast with the Ultimate Comics Gonky Lee in mind. Now, Gonky Lee is voiced by Peter Sohn, director of Pixar's Elemental, movie that despite initially falling short to Across the Spider-Verse at the June 2023 box office, eventually went on to make a pretty solid profit throughout the summer. And was initially written off as a flop, was actually kind of a sleeper hit. Folks, these animators aren't really in competition with each other. They really do lift each other up. Rachel Dratch voices a guidance counselor and says, Can't have your cake. And eat it too. Unless you bake two cakes. Later, buying two cakes screws Miles over because he can't thwip with both in his hands. There's a little character beat that I love here. I, I gotta get back to being a great student, so can we make this quick? Okay. Yeah, Miles goes silent when his mom looks at him, and when his dad glares at him, he sits up straight. Two different non-verbal parenting stares that tell this kid everything he needs to know. And when they learn about his beat in Spanish, Rio snaps at Miles, making a little Puerto Rican flag. The shame draped in his heritage. The guidance counselor says, Miles has a great story to tell. Having a story at all seems gross. You're I love this line because it foreshadows Miles' conflict with Miguel later. Miguel demanding that he follow a canon event blueprint, and also this idea that high school kids probably feel annoyed nowadays at having to encounter encapsulate their whole existence into some kind of story narrative for their college applications. It is pretty gross. Miles wants to go to Princeton because they are studying dark matter. I could help figure out how to travel to other dimensions. Really, 
this poor kid wants to build a path to find his friends. When Miles resumes his fight with the spot, they portal through the high school and they pass this kid with glasses who later shows up on the street. The same kid with a goofy smile from the 2018 movie who I called a dumbass in my June breakdown. I think that was pretty unfair. He's not a dumbass. He's a straight up serial killer and I hope he burns in hell. They end up with Jeff back at the Alchemax site where the final battle in the last movie took place and Jeff has to make a leap of faith, but chickens out. <laughs> Yes, this is the same gag as Miles chickening out from his leap of faith the first time in the 2018 movie. The spot flings three portals at Miles, and Miles rolls midair to dodge them, reminding us of Peter Parker's big move in the 2002 film when he dodged Green Goblin's razors in the burning building. The spot reveals his origin as the creator of the Alchemax Collider device in the 2018 film. I ran a test on this collider that brought a spider here from another dimension. Oh my god, that Earth-42 spider was about to bite Earth-42 Miles, who later becomes the Prowler. Notice how he has the same hair braids. And unlike 1610 Miles, who was out spray painting walls, this kid was actually in school at the time. He is gallant to our Miles Goofus. I just think it's another clue that Prowler Miles is actually a destined hero, and not the villain that we think he is at the end of the movie. I also like how the 2018 movie foreshadowed the fact that the number 42 spider came from another dimension by having it randomly glitch at times. And yes, we learned that Jonathan Owen was the guy Miles hit with a bagel in the 2018 film at the Hudson Valley Alchemax Lab. One of our favorite animation details from the past five years led to one of the biggest consequences, and I love it. The spot kicking his own butt causes his one eye hole to shrink, and when he first falls into himself, notice how he has no holes on his body here. First, the spot sticks his head into what looks like a 1940s animated reality with visible Ben Day dots, and a woman with a polka dot blouse looking like his skin is who attacks him immediately. Next, he peers into the Legoverse, Earth 13122. These Lego scenes in this movie were actually animated by 14-year-old Lego animator Preston Mutaga, who has made a number of incredible Lego versions of these scenes. He was actually emailed by the movie's producers to see if he wanted to do these parts of the movie, and he did such a good job. Okay, then the spot looks into Miss Chen's bodega in Chinatown from the Venom movies. Earth 688, it is labeled. And the gum he takes is the Venom Mint brand, which is a flavor, I guess, named after Venom in this reality. The spot says, Power of the multiverse in the palm of my hand. Of course, a callback to Doc Ock's big line in the 2004 Spider-Man 2. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. Which also got called back in No Way Home. And then we briefly return to the Legoverse with another J.K. Simmons soundbite here. Tomorrow morning, Spider-Man, page one, uh -huh. with a decent picture this time. You're absolutely right, boss. I'm so Shut up. We see a Daily Bugle on the wall reading Doc Ock still at large, which seems like it was from the 2004 Spider-Man 2 film. And then the other three Lego people in this room that Peter passes are probably also the Daily Bugle staff from the Raimi era films. It looks like a Lego Betty Brant there. And then on the couch, that looks like Lego versions of Robbie and Hoffman. Also, you'll notice the text box of the Lego verse is a red Lego brick. Okay, onto the rooftop party. We see some kids playing with teriyaki mon cards. These are the 1610 versions of Pokemon cards. Miles has these floating around his room later. Like Tobey Maguire, Peter Parker having to take the elevator in Spider Man 2, Miles has to ride a crowded subway train. Miles then hops onto the track to quickly zap the villain, the armadillo, and then he foils the thief stealing Nikes and passes the mass murderer I mentioned before. Also, notice this abomination has a gross Miles style pubescent mustache. Ugh. Jeff Morales toasts the mural of Aaron, which Miles probably painted it's definitely up there laughing at me right now up there in retrospect makes it sound like earth 42 is the up there that's the limbo afterlife this movie ends in and jeff promises and i will always always be here for you and by here in Earth-42, it's the same rooftop where Jeff is there, just in the form of a memorial mural. Miles changes into his number 42 jersey, matching his spider's number. And yes, I always have to repeat everything the number 42 references. Because if I don't, there's one commenter who's like, oh, it's also a reference to this. Okay, number 42. Yes, it's Miles' number. It's the number of the spider. It's Jackie Robinson's number. It's the Hitchhiker's Guide number. Aside from Jackie Robinson, all these numbers are just referencing each other. Miles' cake Rex now read, I'm not proud. Jeff and Rio complain that Genki calls them by the first name so that later when Gwen does it, they totally cringe. Miles refers to his friends Peter and Gwanda using Gwen's fake name that she gave him in the first film. And after Rio corrected his Spanglish earlier, notice how he talks back now. Miles put them on break. Is that Spanglish? Ooh boy, you're gonna get the chancla. So Miles goes down to his room where boxing gloves hang by the door. Again, reminding us of his boxing lessons with Uncle Aaron and the punching bag that he's gonna be tied up to at the end of the movie. There's also a Michelle Obama campaign sticker suggesting that in 1610, she was the Obama who held or at least sought public office. Floating in this room is the Amazing Fantasy number 15 comic that was altered slightly from the 2018 movie. It's coming back from that film. And on Miles' shelf is his RC Spider-Mobile, which 1610 Peter had a life-size version of. And above that, there is a photo of Miles' dad, Jeff, and 
Aaron that Jeff had on his phone background and was also framed in Aaron's apartment. And on his shelf to the left, Miles has this wooden moose. This is an Easter egg for Lord and Miller's 2021 film, Mitchells vs. Machines, a very, very important totem to the Mitchell family in that film. Just watch it, it's so good. Now in Miles' sketchbook, he kept a bus ticket stub, Hudson Valley Explorer, Schenectady to Brooklyn Central. This is the bus ride home that they took after Gwen saved them from Olivia Octavius. So basically Gwen keeps a photo, Miles keeps a ticket stub. So she's flattered by this. The two of them remember each other the same way. Miles and Gwen swing from the construction crane to construction crane, kind of like Andrew Garfield Spider-Man does in the climax of the 2012 Amazing Spider-Man film. And as they thread the needle between the buses, notice how all the blocks are just colored pink and teal hues. So Gwen's colors are tinting this reality. There's a fun POV shot from the truck driver. Miles swings on the right side, reflected in the mirrors. And then we turn to the right side mirrors as he flies behind and the exclamation points from his scream chase him like the ah from his fall in the 2018 film and the woo in the final act, Miles asks, Who's Miguel? Oh, he's like a ninja, vampire, Spider-Man, but a good guy? A vampire good guy. I'd pay good money to see that. Yeah, it's kind of a meta nod to Morbius, the living vampire, a good guy vampire that Sony hoped we would pay good money to see twice. Miles stays behind Gwen throughout this whole sequence, hiding his clumsy collisions, and he's just trying to come off as cooler and more confident, but really he's just copying what Gwen does, just not as well, kind of like how he hastily ties his web to his ankle. They pass a hot dog vendor, and we see the action word take on the hot dog swipe, and Miles swips money to the vendor's chest. If you look closely, this is an alternate universe $25 bill. Gwen says, Like, last week we had this mission to some Shakespeare dimension. What? Yeah, Marvel actually published a book called William Shakespeare's Avengers that retells Avengers stories in iambic pentameter. And I love this little kid who just just mindlessly licks the window of the train with a big smile. It's so gross. It's kind of a callback to when Miles put his mouth on Aaron's window in the 2018 movie. Now Gwen plants a drone to spy on the spot's apartment. Above it is a billboard with a bagel. All of it, always, all over the place. Seven time Tony Award winner, which must be a play version of the bagel themed multi Oscar winning film, Everything Everywhere All at Once. And again, the movie's animators are acknowledging the bagel parallel with Jonathan Owen. There's also this phone number, 1-917-161-0616. 17, the New York area code, 1610, Miles' universe, 616, the main Marvel universe. And I also just chuckle at decent view. But my favorite shot of the film is Miles and Gwen looking out over the city upside down from the Williamsburg Bank building. When Gwen first walks upside down, the sun disappears briefly behind her and then reappears. It's just so beautiful. The artist added layers of hazy background skyscrapers, including some that are just unfilled contour lines because these Brooklyn and Chelsea kids can't really imagine how far the city goes. Whereas live action films use matte painting to try to look realistic. Here the painted backdrop is trying to look intentionally painted and it's just perfect for these characters. Gwen and Miles sit upside down, whipping the underside of the overhang. And then as they sit, their hands and their legs must just be sticky. But as they hang upside down, you can see gravity tugging their eyebrows and their cheeks and their foreheads upward. Just such, such good attention to detail. Now Gwen says, In every other universe, Gwen Stacy falls for Spider-Man. And in every other universe, it doesn't end well. Yeah, not only is she referring to Earth-65, Peter's death as the lizard, she's also referring to the universe where Gwen Stacy famously dies in the death of Gwen Stacy arc. You know. Rio tells Miles about the boy she really worries about. Wherever you go from here, you have to promise to take care of that little boy for me. Make sure he never forgets where he came from. And he never doubts that he is loved. It's so sweet. And she's referring to him, obviously, but she's using the third person here, which allows us to apply this to Miles taking care of Earth-42 Miles, his multiversal brother, to make that boy feel loved too. When Miles re-zips his pants back up, I love how the re-zip word bends and folds inward like Miles' pants fly wood. On the way to Owen's place, there is a sign, Soda, it's a generic brand. And inside his whole filled apartment, you can see a certificate for Alchemax Breakthrough of the Year with a hole on the O of Owen, and it's signed by Olivia we actually see her in a photo with Jonathan. She stole his research. His spider containers are labeled Earth-42. That was the spider that bit Miles, R.I.P. There's also 14512, that's Penny Parker's universe. 333, that's the universe of an alternate Electro, Maxwell Dillon. There's 90214, that's Nora's universe. 19925, that's the universe supposedly written by a bot. And then 509, the universe of Andros Stark. Miles jumps in after Gwen in the portal tunnel and lands in Earth-50101, Mumbatton, a cross between Mumbai and Manhattan. And it looks amazing. From above, its geography looks 
looks like the island of Manhattan, but greener, and what we think are the rivers are actually the city's lower levels. The artist designed Manhattan to keep going down and down and down, a contrast from 1610 Manhattan that just goes up and up and up. In Manhattan, instead of the trains running on top of the tracks, the cars hang from the rail above them. When Miles falls through this reality, his animation style changes to match it. Similarly, you'll notice later he becomes more 3D in Nueva York to match Miguel O'Hara's design. When Miles bumps into stuff here, the action words are all in Hindi. In Manhattan, there's a billboard for Sacred Wars. Oh my god, could this be this universe's Avengers Secret Wars? Is this all a sign that this animated Miles Morales or just some Miles Morales is gonna be in Secret Wars? I swear to god, if Miles isn't in Secret Wars, uh, I guess I'll still see it, but you know, I want him to be in it. Preventer Prabhakar, Spider-Man India from Earth 50101 is voiced by Karen Sony, aka Dopender from the Deadpool films. He spins his web shooter from a spindle like a yo-yo. When he hits his spot in the back of the head, it makes a Hindi word, dadak, which kind of means bang or slam. Pav's acrobatic movement and the way he flattens his feet is based on a 2,000 year old martial art from the Indian region of Kerala. Pav talks about drinking chai. I love chai tea. What did you just say? Chai tea? Chai means tea, oh, bro. Oh, You're um, saying tea um, tea. Um. Yes, Miles is so distracted over being redundant that he spills the tea, which flows out onto the table. Spot says he's on a journey of self-discovery, and Pav calls him out for the Western cliche, referencing eat, pray, love. But this is also something Jason Schwartzman did in the Wes Anderson movie, The Darjeeling Limited. So it's kind of a perfect reference. As they fight the Spot, we see his dark matter has now filled in more of his body so that he's gradually going more from white to black. The Spot activates the Mumbatten Collider and Hobie Brown crashes it. Hobie's comic book Page actually shows his comic moment when he told Green Goblin, this, no more speeches, Norman. I'm gonna kick your ass. Hobie's electric guitar smashes through the barrier and he advises Miles to use his whole palms, not just his fingertips, setting up Miles' big move later and suggesting that Hobie might have a similar electricity coursing through his body. Hobie Brown's body in this movie was animated on threes with his vest offset and his guitar is animated on fours and his general outline is animated on twos. So they actually separated different parts of his body for an overall anarchal punk rock aesthetic. Each of his guitar poses are truly iconic poses. There's only so many different frames his guitar can be in. And this shows how Hobie chooses to be out of step with the other spider people, even more grounded in his source medium than Miles was. And it shows Miles that there is another way to exist in this multiverse, an arguably more powerful way. Hobie says, I hate the AM, I hate the PM, I hate labels. I'm not a hero because calling yourself a hero makes you a self-pathologizing narcissistic autocrat. Hate the PM is some cockney wordplay, hating the time of day and the prime minister. And notice how he drags his boot across an image of Kingpin. Was Kingpin the prime minister of Hobie's reality. I'm just curious to know what their history was. The Alchemax building collapses, raining rubble on the city. The four leap into action. Pop sees his girlfriend on a double-decker bus on the bridge, recalling the MCU Peter Parker's girlfriend, MJ in danger on the double-decker bus and far from home. Everyone gets saved, but Miles disrupted the canon event of Captain Singh's death, causing dark matter to consume the city. Jessica Drew arrives with a team to contain it. Ezekiel Sims Spider-Man with a motorcycle jacket. There's a curvy Spider-Woman. There's also a super bulky variant who might be Spider-Hulk. And then this armored one that's Spider-Armor Mark III. And then we see Max Bourne from Earth 2211. So onto Earth 928, Nueva York. Hobie's color, you'll notice, now turns monotone, which always happens whenever he's not really thrilled with his current situation. And just like before on the bank roof, Miles looks out on the city upside down. He's actually ascending, but for him, it feels like he's descending. So it's not a heroic rise, it's more of a plunge into hell for the character. They arrive and we meet Malala Windsor, Spider UK from Earth 835. She's voiced by Sophia Barclay. She says, anyone spot the spot? I just asked if anyone else's jokes and we see all these blue text boxes showing everyone else's jokes. C spot run, X marks a weird looking bad guy, our search plan is full of holes, did he say quip or thip, we need to run a spot check, well somebody got up on the wrong side of the web this morning, he could be in any hole in the world, puns on my weak spot, he's probably hiding out in some hole in the wall, hey way to put us on a spot mate, this search is starting to peter out. There's also one in the background just saying shh which is kind of creepy. Also, we see an Alex Ross concept art Spider-Man. Alex Ross came up with this and it was later used to inspire Superior Spider-Man in the comics. As the camera glides through the main hall of the HQ, we pass a black and yellow Spider-Armor Mark II sitting on the left, Mary Jane Parker, AKA Spinnerette from the 2015 limited run Renew Your Vows and her daughter, Anna May Parker, Spider-Ling. There's a steampunky looking one. This is May Riley, Lady Spider from Earth 803. There's a traffic cop Spider-Man. There's the bombastic Bagman when Peter Parker breaks into the Baxter building and puts on a Fantastic Four costume and has to put a brown paper bag over 
Spider-Verse said, though here it's just a Spider-Man suit. We see the Flash Thompson Spider-Man with the Letterman jacket, also Spider-Wolf. Miles passes Peter parked car of Earth 53931. He pulls up and inside of him, there's Tarantula of Earth 1610A. Technically, these movies are set in 1610B. Spider side of Earth 616. Last stand of Earth 312500. Peter of Earth 13122, otherwise known as the Lego Universe, we saw earlier. Andy Samberg voices Ben Riley, aka the Scarlet Spider of Earth 94. Taron Killam voices Web Slinger from Earth 31913 and his horse Widow, who also wears masks, miles towards the anomaly villains. We see a grizzly, several Doc Ox, a Moose Tyrio, and a Mysterio. In the video game section, we see the Insomniac Spider Man of Earth 1048. That's the universe of the PlayStation games. He asks, Are you talking to me? And that's the voice of Yuri Lowenthal, who voices Peter Parker in those games. But beside him is the Green Goblin from the 1982 Spider Man Atari game, and then this blue pixelated video man. He's from Spider Man and his amazing friends. He has the ability to suck people into video games. There's a villain named Typeface who says, go to Helvetica, Spider-Man. And all of his words appear in different typefaces and Spider-Man appears in the Sam Raimi era logo font. Miles meets Donald freaking Glover as Prowler. Hey. Hey. It's rude to stare. Cool, that one myself. I slipped. You? Hobie claims he caught him and Glover says, I slipped. Now remember Glover played Aaron Davis in the MCU in Spider-Man Homecoming in 2017 and cameoed in the 2018 Spider-Verse film from his scene in NBC's community when Troy wears Spider-Man PJs. Either way, seeing cartoons with live action, just more likely that we're gonna get live action Miles Morales. And the fact that Hobie caught him, again, there's more to Hobie's backstory that I look forward to seeing too in the next movie. Miles bumps into Margot Kess, AKA Spider-Bite from Earth 22191. She's voiced by Amanda Stenberg. And right away, you can see a shared spider sense between them later when they part ways they're definitely flirty there some real chemistry so if things don't work out with Gwen I think these two are gonna end up together and Margot's real home she has this poster we be incognito with a Guy Fox logo so a version of the hacker group anonymous but I just got this listen closely here here is better. It's implied that Margot's parents are fighting all the time and she comes here to escape. It's so sad. As they enter Miguel's lab, notice how Hobie swipes stuff off the wall so that later he can engineer his own multiverse watch for Gwen. There's also all these futuristic versions of tech from villains Miguel has defeated, including the claw of a prowler, the arms of Doc Ock, the glider of Green Goblin, but most importantly in this room, you'll see in the background, Miguel is totally building his red and white 2099 suit from the game. Miguel launches into his big explanation of everything. First, depicting all of reality with his glowing white vine with branches, which is definitely supposed to look like the sacred timeline of the MCU. So definitely this Spider-Verse is connected to the live action MCU. But over this white vine, we see straight red lasers beaming out to represent the Spider-Verse. And Miguel refers to it as the web of life and destiny, which is a term for the comics, or in his words, arachno-humanoid poly multiverse. All the nodes we see represent canon events. In the first one, we see six different comic moments when a spider bite occurred, including this early one where Peter wears the yellow vest. But behind that are various moments where Peter and Mary Jane kissed. And we see Kirsten Dunst, Mary Jane, kissed to Tobey Maguire Peter in the rain from the 2002 film. But then to the left, the next node, Miguel refers to as very, very bad, showing six moments the Venom symbiote overtook Eddie Brock in the comics. One of these witches is when Tobey Maguire Peter pulled the symbiote off himself in Spider-Man 3. Miguel singles out Event ASM 90, which is a nod to Amazing Spider-Man number 90, in which George Stacy saves a kid. This is the same comics art here during Spider-Man's fight with Doc Ock that ends up taking George's life. Miles turns over to a parallel moment, a projection of Andrew Garfield Peter Parker crying over the body of Dennis Leary, Captain Stacy from 2012's Amazing Spider-Man film when George was killed by Reese Eifens the Lizard. Other canon events that we see are implied to be the Spider-Man No More step that Hobie Brown sees himself in. That's from Amazing Spider-Man number 50. Jessica Drew trapped under the rubble. That's from the Amazing Spider-Man number 33. And we actually saw Tom Holland Peter Parker going through this in Homecoming. And then this wedding issue, the Amazing Spider-Man annual number 21 that Peter B. Parker sees himself in. Meanwhile, Gwen seems to be looking at a Death of Gwen Stacy issue, which for her must be pretty haunting. We see the Cliff Robertson Uncle Ben dying from the 2002 film and Tobey Maguire Peter Parker crying over him. To the right of that is the animated spectacular Spider-Man voiced by Josh Keaton in this movie as he was in the animated series, the moment his Uncle Ben died, and then on the far right is Uncle Ben's death cutscene from the PS4 game. So Miles breaks free and he runs for it. Miguel alerts the rest who all point to each other in the classic Spider-Man pointing meme, but then Miguel says, I coño Miles! I coño is Spanish for essentially, God damn it. Max Born steps up to this awesome looking Spider-Woman, Anya Corazon, who looks badass and she has that noticeable D ring on her belt. Some of you know what that means. 
There's also a Canadian Spider-Woman chasing Miles. According to production designer Patrick O'Keefe, she got her look from the 1972 Summit series hockey jerseys. There's a stubby, chibi Spider-Man. There's a cyborg Spider-Woman. Spider-Cat scratches up Miles' face and coughs up a web hairball. Its tech is on its tail. There's a Spider-Rex or Peter Petarker from Earth-66. It tith whips. Miles lunges toward camera, fleeing the manga Spider-Man and the bombastic Bagman by turning his spag sideways. And then Spider-Man Unlimited from the 90s series with his cape. In the cafeteria, you'll notice they serve Miguel themed hamburgers. There's a spider monkey here. There's a Julia Carpenter spider woman. And then we get this moment. And then I looked at my uncle and- Uh, let me guess. He died? On the walls of this therapy office is an ink blot test that naturally looks like a spider. There's a diploma from Ditko University, a nod to Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko. Miles ends up in a duel with Web Slinger. On the count of three, draw one. Get away for three! Yeah, I love how the aspect ratio shifts to look like a Clint Eastwood film. Peter B. Parker follows them. Can you take a photo of this? It's her first chase. Mayday whips the button to take the selfie. Miles passes Charlotte Weber, the sun spider, who has ehlers danlos syndrome that affects her joints and connective tissue. She uses a wheelchair and crutches, and she makes a pun about crutches. She's voiced by Danielle Perez. 1967 Spider-Man, voiced by Yorma Tacone, tries to grab Miles, but he misses him because 67 Spidey is in 2D, and he flies right past him. Miles runs through the strength and conditioning gym with 90 Spider-Man animated versions of the Sinister Six, including a Doc Ock who says, Hello, Peter. Using Alfred Molina Doc Ock's line from Spider-Man No Way Home. Hello, Peter. Composer Metro Boomin cameos as one of the spider people. So after the chase outside the building, Peter B. Parker tries to get Miles to hold Mayday, saying he's the reason he had her, reminding us of that 2018 film when Peter B. Parker had to split with MJ because he didn't want to have kids. But upon meeting Miles Morales and seeing how cool of a hero he was, he asked himself, Do I want kids? Miguel chases Miles on the skybound bullet train. After kicking Miguel, breaking some of the glass off, just like it did in the big heroic montage of the first film, Miles ends up back in the tunnel on someone else's car. What's up, man? Wait a minute, circular glasses, I knew you, that's my nemesis, all smiling dumbass. I hope the moon explodes when you get to it. At one point on Miles' lunge, a frame flashes from an animation storyboard cell, including some artist notes, Imperial Violet and Crimson Red. This instructs the artist what ink color to use to fill in the character. Those shades are the specific shades of red and indigo for Miguel's suit. And at one point, Miles glitches into his store-bought costume from the 2018 movie that he bought from Stan Lee. This is just an insane sequence, and I love it. Miguel leans in, calling Miles a mistake. It gets darker and darker as they leave Earth's stratosphere to inner space. Miles uses Hobie's advice and Uncle Aaron's advice, a similar move he used on Kingpin, putting a hand on shoulder, full palm electrocution, bugging out Miguel's tech suit to supercharge it. Miles gets away, dives back down, and sneaks past Margo to the go-home machine. But since it reads spider DNA, the screen reads Earth 42, telling us that Miles is not going home to 1610. Peter B. Parker puts Mayday down to sleep, and we see that she wears spider ham PJs. MJ and him talk about how there's no playbook on being a parent. You just have to make adjustments at halftime, which definitely feels like a meta nod to this story's two-part structure with Beyond the Spider-Verse, where at halftime currently, Spider-Verse is going to be the second half. Miles swings through Earth-42, and there are some Sinister Six cartel red flags if you look closely. There's a sign for Vulture Telecom and Electro 2G Cell Service. On the rooftop later, there's signs for Scorpo, which might be an alternate universe, Oscorp. There's a sign for a Rhino Casino, Sandman Slots and Resort, a Vote for Craven sign, and what I thought might be a Shocker S, but that might just be for Scorpo. Earth-42 Times Square has W and W's, alternate M&M's, which also have the colors reversed from the regular and peanut M&M. Instead of Forever 21, there's Never 21, which makes me really worried about the life expectancy of this reality. Miles passes images of Noir and Ham and Penny, and the train tracks turn into giant Olivia Octavius arms, and Miles returns to his room, but whereas before his outfit was blue and red, now the colors are green and purple, which are Prowler's colors. We also see blueprints of the Prowler gauntlets on his shelf. Now, it may just be the lighting, but it kind of looks like Rio has green eyes in Earth-42 instead of the other reality where they're brown. Miles' poster above his bed is Oshami on green instead of Sashimi on red as it is in 1610. Rio asks, do you shoot silk out of your culito, which is Spanish for little butt? And Miles says, I had a nightmare about that once, but no. And since this is connected to the MCU, Multiverse of Madness dream walking rules do apply in which dreams are you in another universe. And both America Chavez and MCU Peter Parker speculated about alternate Spider-Men shooting webs out of their butts. So you know what's somewhere out there, there's one who is. I also like how Miles demonstrates his web shooting abilities with sad little thwip, thwip. Miles realizes he was sent to the wrong universe and here in Earth 42, Uncle Aaron is still alive and he comes through the door. Uncle Aaron? 
Hey. Yup, yeah, there it is. Hey. His romantic advice in 2018. Aaron mentions Miles took his braids out, signaling that there is another Miles in this universe. The rooftop mural is now a memorial for Jeff Morales. And in the upper corners of that mural, Pacelli and Bendis. For Sarah Pacelli and Brian Michael Bendis, creators of the Miles Morales character. Aaron's phone lights up and he gives Miles a bit of side eye, meaning his phone text came from Earth 42 Miles and Aaron knows something's weird here. Miles gets KO'd and his spider sense never goes off. Maybe because he can't sense himself, especially that variant doesn't have spider powers. It just kind of like glitches his spidey sense out. Miles wakes up tied to the punching bag that he and Aaron used to train on and the one that he tied Peter B. Parker up to. The colors in this room are red and blue, which is the aura that Miles' color changed to from purple and green to red and blue when 1610 Peter looked at him. So I think that is a good sign for Earth 42 Miles and Aaron. And the red and blue mix on Miles' face, forming purple in the middle, something he has in common with his variant. On the TV, we hear J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson talking about the Sinister Six cartel and how no one will try to stop them. I think Aaron and Prowler Miles are trying to stop them and that spider was just about to bite this Miles. I think he's a good kid. Also notice Miles' shoes. Miles started tying his shoes in the 2018 film to show his maturity, but when he's tied up to Aaron's punching bag, he's back to his shoes being untied. He famously wears Air Jordan 1s, red and white with a black swoosh. Remember that gank he stole from him? But Earth 42 Miles wears ones with alternate black colors. But the film does not end on the Mileses. It ends with Gwen Stacy's drum solo, just like it began. And now we see her assembling Peter B. Parker, Mayday, Hobie Brown, Pav, Margot, and returning for the first film, Penny, Ham, and Noir. Her final line is, You want in? Yeah, she couldn't fit in with her own band, so she started her own. Her opening monologue and this closing monologue here are part of one speech. This is her pitch to them to help her save her best friend, to join her on this apology tour. I want to thank Eric Francisco, Jordan Morris, Gina Ippolito, and Erica Wusu for their research help on this breakdown. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. You can follow me at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.